Okay, good early evening, good afternoon. I want a warm welcome to our panel. Um, I think we're going to try to make a premise. It's going to be very difficult not to ask the question about the Eurozone, but I've been doing coverage for the last two days, and all we seem to talk about is a recession in the Eurozone. So I'm almost tempted to have everybody stand up and start shaking away and say we're going to talk about growth for the next hour. How's that? Why not? So uh, can emerging markets deliver uh, global growth? That's our, our premise uh, this evening. It's a simple premise, but it should have a fairly uh, straightforward answer. Uh, 2011, we saw a substantial growth gap between, shall we say, the incumbents and the newcomers, the incumbents being the uh, OECD industrialized countries, producing growth of only 2% in 2011, uh, and the emerging markets, so the newcomers coming onto the market last year at 6.5% uh, for 2011. Now, the reality, if the projections are right, is that we're going to see the global economy go from $70 trillion as it is today in 2011-12 to some $300 trillion or $308 trillion by the year 2030. The other interesting figure tucked away into that is that 68% of that growth should come from the emerging markets alone. Another shocking figure in that sort of uh, calculation is that 98% of the population growth will probably come from the emerging markets as well. So you see where the vibrancy uh, should be coming between now and 2030. Long term, it's promising then. Short term, probably more challenging. In fact, the World Bank last week came out with a report suggesting that uh, the emerging market should hope for the best in 2012, but prepare for the worst. They've lowered down the projections for the emerging markets. I'm pretty solid believer that we've seen a lot of decoupling taking place in the last five years, and certainly we've come a long ways from 2008 uh, to 2012. The other kind of surprising news there, between 2008 and 2011, when uh, the West was contracting, the global economy still grew $9 trillion, and again, two-thirds of the growth came from the emerging markets. Half of that growth came from China alone. So we're talking about substantial uh, tailwinds here pushing the global economy forward coming from the emerging markets. Very quickly on the uh, format this afternoon, we're going to have a two 15-minute uh, block discussion uh, making up the half-hour special which is going to run Sunday on our new emerging markets program on CNN called the Global Exchange. It's going to run at 1700 Central European time. We're going to have a short video report to introduce the first block, which is going to be the global outlook, and then the second block we'll introduce on the global risk for emerging markets in 2012. This is an entire debate, no uh, opening comments, no speeches, no PowerPoints. The last 15 minutes will be coming from you from the floor, so prepare your questions so we can have a very uh, healthy debate at the very end. So to start our uh, initial discussion, let's take a look at the global outlook for 2012 for the emerging markets. We have a video report. If last year's financial turmoil shows us anything, it is that the economic balance of power is shifting east. The world economy is more dependent on China's juggernaut economy than ever before. Emerging markets, the new drivers of growth, the one bright spot on an otherwise bleak horizon. In 2012, the shift east continues. Not that emerging markets have survived unscathed from the crisis that still engulfs the euro area. Forecasts have been cut. Manufacturing is down. Fiscal policies will need to be tweaked. Standard Chartered Bank forecasts the world economy will grow 2.2 percent this year, still hamstrung by the Eurozone crisis for at least the first half of 2012. Emerging markets will be responsible for the bulk of that growth and the world's best hope to stave off a global recession. The developed world, where growth will be anemic at best, will cast envious eyes at the BRIC nations in 2012. According to the World Bank, China's growth rate will continue to slow this year, but still be over 8%. India is predicted to grow a healthy 6%. Russia and Brazil, a solid 3.5%. But emerging markets are not immune to events in the West. An escalation in the Eurozone crisis in 2012 will spare no one, and that includes the BRIC nations. But where once the emerging markets look to Europe and America to lead the way, this year the global economy will hope emerging markets can help fuel growth, stimulate spending, and pull the world away from recession. Okay, that gives us a short introduction of uh, what it's all about. Let's introduce our panel. Uh, from the center is Excellency uh, the Deputy Prime Minister Ali Babajan. Uh, from Turkey, of course. Luciano Coutinho is the president of the Brazilian Development Bank. On his right is Stephen Roach, 
uh, formerly of, uh, of Morgan Stanley, but also a professor at Yale University. Uh, Sunil Bharti Mittal, of course, by the Bharti Enterprises of India, that uh, shares his name. Li Dakoi is an economist from China. And uh, Martin Sorrell, of course, is the chief executive officer of WPP. Gentlemen, all welcome here. Uh, let's start on the, the first question, which I'd like to put forward to Mr. Babajan, because I think it's very interesting that you sit and straddle <laughs> between East and West. Um, do you think the tailwinds that you're facing right now from the Eurozone will slow down the economy, as many are suggesting, below the 4% that you're hoping to get for 2012? Uh, Turkish uh, experience and the reform process has been quite a unique one. On one hand, we are in the EU accession process, trying to become a European Union member country, but also we have many aspects of a developing and emerging market as well. Uh, what we have done at the beginning of the crisis was to, to go through a fiscal consolidation program and keep our banks strong and safe. So the two major areas of problems in Europe, public debt and weak banks, does not exist in Turkey. And that differentiated us and have very high growth rates for the last two years, 9% in 2010 and 8% in 2011. But in order to make sure that this is a sustainable growth, we started to do some tightening on the monetary policy side and also on the, uh, on the banking sector as well through some macro prudential measures. Uh, your question about how EU affects us is made mainly two channels, the trade channel and the financing channel. 45% of, of our exports go to the European Union member countries, and also we get a lot of FDI from EU member states. So when things go in a, a bad direction in the European Union, we are affected through those two channels. But on the other hand, uh, the good part of the uh, picture is that 55% of our exports goes elsewhere, and those markets, the 55% uh, non-European markets of our exports, are now growing quite fast. And that is playing a very good balancing role. Domestic consumption is also very strong because of high confidence of consumers and also high confidence of producers. Uh, so people are spending, in, uh, companies are investing, and banks are lending. But in order to make sure that this turns into an overheating problem or turns into an unsustainable current accounts deficit problem, we have actually started to tighten things. That's why our uh, growth rate is going to be lower than the previous two years. Let me follow up quickly then. Are you confident you can produce better than 35 to 4% growth in 2012 after that stellar year, better than 8% last year? A lot of things depend on what is going to happen in the European Union. Because we have projected a 4% growth for ourselves, given a scenario that things will not go worse in the European Union. If things recover in the European Union, if we get a better than expected uh, outlook in the European Union, then we might see high growth rates. But if things go worse in the European Union, then we might see growth rates below 4%. How, how so a lot depends GDP, on the European Union. How much of your GDP is exports? Uh, it is still 15% or so. 15? 15%. 15 percent. Okay. So it's not a big uh, yeah. percentage yet. Uh, just Stephen, add, let just me follow add. up if I can here. Uh, John, John, just a just, suggestion, just, just a second, please. Yeah, okay. uh, suggestion first is that we should hope for the best, uh, Stephen, is what the World Bank is uh, saying, but prepare for the worst. Uh, they ratcheted down the target for developing countries down to 5.4% uh, this month. Is that... Uh, an overreaction to what we see with the growth coming from China, India, countries like Turkey, Southeast Asia, even Africa? Well, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. We've been doing that on Wall Street for a dozen years. It really hasn't helped. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I think in light of where we've been, John, over the last three or four years, uh, you, you, it would be absurd if you just... Uh, pretended that the world was uh, going to be fine. You definitely have to prepare uh, for the worst. I, I think the, the best case, though, is um, much better than it was three years ago, uh, in, unless, of course, we have a, a very disorderly uh, breakup of the EMU. We promised we wouldn't talk about that, but to me that's <clears throat> the potential black swan event that we all have to think about. I don't think it's going to happen, but, again, we can't pretend that an outcome like that uh, uh, would, would not occur. Uh, global trade contracted um, 
about 12 percent in volume terms in 2009. That was a devastating blow to every country in the world, including uh, my favorite economy in the world, China. Uh, China, it, it pushed China into the functional equivalent uh, of a, a brief recession and evoked a very strong uh, uh, policy response. So a big shock, this concept of decoupling is, is, is really irrelevant. Uh, I think the word should be stricken from the lexicon of uh, macro and investment analysts. We need to look at, you know, a, a, I think a, a more meaningful construct, which is resilience. I think the emerging markets, the developing economy, uh, the, uh, of the world has great resilience, but um, they're going to have to do things, change the mix uh, of their economy, uh, focusing much more on their internal markets rather than relying on these squishy external markets uh, in uh, Europe and in the United States. Uh, Luciano Coutinho of Brazil. Now, you've got, had a case uh, last year at this time growing about 7%. You saw that growth cut in half. What's interesting about Brazil is that the unemployment rate hit a low of 4.7 percent in the last month. So there's still job creation taking place, but the growth dropped substantially. Central banks started cutting interest rates, so you had to go into you know, high gear here to re resuscitate the growth. Well, that was largely on purpose because we had to decelerate the economy to cope with inflation pressure in the first half of last year. And now we are uh, trying to expand again and uh, uh, markets are projecting 3.5% for this year, but I think we will do our best to accelerate investment and have a better number, 4.5 would be. Uh, but let me complement what Stephen was saying, that it's not just resilience, but it is a fact that if we have a moving average in the last five, six years, emerging economies show a growth differential of 35 to 4 percentage points to developed economies. And this is a long-term trend. I mean, you might see some uh, short-term coupling, short-term variation go together, but the growth differential is there. And the growth differential is there because we have, in almost all emerging economies, very attractive investment frontiers that provide high profit. Mm. Just in for instance, take the energy sector, take the housing, take the, the uh, basic uh, manufacturing, uh, and also uh, very dynamic domestic markets that are able to create jobs, create demand, and, and, and then uh, 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 the concept of a certain degree of autonomy to grow. Mm. And this is a changing paradigm. I think this could be dated back to 2006, 2007 onwards. So this is a... a to boost domestic demand. Let me turn to Martin Sorrell here. You're a very firm believer of the BRIC concept, and you've expanded that into what Jim O'Neill likes to call Goldman Sachs, the next 11, the next wave of fast-growing economies. And what he economies. calls mi MIST as well. You know, Mexico, Indonesia, we have friends with Indonesia, South Korea and Turkey, of course, Mr. Babachan as well. So this is where you've taken WPP. We're betting the ranch. I mean, it's not, a CEO shouldn't say, I bet, and shouldn't say anything about ranches, I guess, but I'm, I'm betting the ranch on it. And I just want to comment on your opening film a bit. This, this concept of moving to the east I find slightly objectionable. It's a, forgive the, the, the comparison, it's an American, uh, Americanism. You can guarantee this will be edited out of the program. Yeah, it will. Well, it doesn't go to New, <laughs> it doesn't go to New York anyway, so I, I think I'm risk-free. But, but if New York is the center of the world, which I think generally we think it is, it's not just the shift to the east, to China and India. It's a shift to the south. This is the decade of Latin America. We'll have the World Cup in the Olympics in 2014, 2016. That will define Brazil. It will define Latin America just as Beijing and China was defined by the Olympics and South Africa was defined by the World Cup. It's a move to the southeast. Sunil knows very well as he takes Airtel and by Zayn and rebrands Airtel, a Zayn Airtel in South Africa. It's a move to Africa and the Middle East too. So that's number one. Number two, Turkey. If Turkey grows at four, we will grow at 10 this year. In fact, our budgets media, advertising companies are underbranded in these markets, so they grow at double the rate of GMP, certainly as Stephen knows, in early stages of development. 
Uh, the decoupling word, I just want to pick up on the decoupling word. I don't think we should ban it, Stephen. Zhu Min made a very interesting point at the HSBC breakfast. He said, financially, we're more coupled than we ever have been. I think uh, Mr. Coutinho will remember this comment. From a trade point of view, we're less and less coupled. The south-to-south -south trade, for example, in Brazil, before President Lula took power, I think America accounted for about 30% of Brazilian exports. Today, it accounts for 12. Who is Brazil's biggest trade partner? China, followed by India. South Africa. Mayor, 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 who's China's biggest trade partners? It's Europe and the United States. Yeah, no, I, I understood. I, segment the world. Uh, yeah, but, we, but the, the, tr the struggle in China is to move them, as you well know, from export to consumption. 12 five-year plan, Stephen, yeah. as you well know, yeah. lowers the growth rate to seven. Please God, the UK would have seven and Western Europe would have seven. Lowers it to seven. They consistently underestimate their performance in their five years plans. Move to consumption, move to healthcare safety net because that's why people save instead of spending. My hope is that these markets, certainly from a WP point of view, continue to grow and develop. I think they will because I think we, we have managed to achieve a degree of decoupling and economic management and the breaking event was Lehman in 2008. Prior to Lehman, people in Brazil, people in India, people in China looked to the West for leadership, certainly financially. Because we really messed up royally in 2008, they, I think they now feel they have little, if anything, to learn and they are less dependent on us and more independent in their thinking, and that's to their benefit. Thanks think. very much. It's not by accident we have our Chinese colleague and Indian colleague sitting next to each other, the two pillars of the emerging market uh, forces at play uh, in, in this uh, generation of growth that we talked about. Li Jokui, uh, can China continue to manage to produce the magic number of 8% in the economy and still kind of bring some cohesiveness to the country? We know the, the vibrant East Coast and the western half of the country, very, very different places. Well, I think speed is not the key issue in China. Most people in China agree that uh, the economy has entered a stage where the potential growth rate of GDP is rather high. By my estimate, this would be close to 9%. The problem is structural, structural problem. The problem is sustainability, whether structural problems today can be resolved, can be reformed, can be dealt with in order for the economy to continue growing in the coming decade. That's the problem. So for this year, for 2012, our forecast, Center for China in the World Economy, is 8.5%, coming down from last year's 9.2%, and next year, most likely, between 8 to 8.5%. Why is that? The economy is slowing down in order to, the reason is in order to repair. It's like a car, there's no way to, to stop the engine. Stop the, stop the car to rep replace the engine. Mean, because the economy has to, has, to go, has to go on, right? Meanwhile, the, the car slows down in order to twist, in order to repair some of the problems of the, of the engine. Hmm. So that's the issue in China. So today in China, the, the key policy debates are, are, are about whether fundamental reforms can be or will be pushed ahead. That's the key issue. Do we have a, a break here? for the emerging markets. We have that inflationary pressure, uh, the food price rise pressure uh, in 2010, 2011. That's come off. Does that give India, uh, Sunil, some breathing room here to lower interest rates? Is it in the position to try to boost growth? I know the Baligarks, as the, the CEOs of India, the leading CEOs are called there, were moaning because growth dropped below 7%. And as Martin suggested, that's a pretty good number. But how do we get beyond that number uh, beyond 2012? Well, clearly inflation has been a cause of uh, worry for the policymakers in India. And we have seen over a dozen in, in, uh, rate of uh, interest increases in the last one year. And that has taken away some momentum from capacity building. Now, there are many economists here, and I talk, take an entrepreneurial view. Uh, if the capacity is not created, you impact the supply a lot. Whatever you may do to manage the demand by raising the interest rates, you're no, never going to get the balance. Uh, the good news is in the last uh, few quarters, in particular last month, food inflation has tapered off. Now, that has given some uh, room to the policymakers to lower their interest rates. Last week, we saw a cut of CRR at, by half a percent. But will that follow through with the reduction in interest rates? I think the industry remains very hopeful. Well, but wait, I mean, you've got a currency problem. 
that really constrains your central bank from being aggressive. India is the only economy in Asia with a current account deficit. So with a weak currency, current account deficit, and you've had one good month on inflation, uh, I think the, the uh, discretion to ease on monetary policy uh, is, is pretty limited in India, especially compared to China. But I think it's been tightened a lot, uh, Stephen, in the last uh, several months. Yeah, yeah. And I think there is a scope for uh, you know, loosening that to some extent. At the end of the day, will 2 or 3% make a huge difference to investment? On the bottom line in balance sheets, not very much. But on the sentiment, it's a lot. Because people then start conserving cash, they start worrying about the future. And I think the government needs to, therefore, give a direction and a signal that we will balance inflation and growth. And that is what the industry is looking for. Well, you bring, bring up an excellent point. There's a, been a lot of complaints internationally about the mixed signals we've been getting from the government of uh, Mamoun Singh. Uh, multi-brands were going to go into the retail market, then they retrenched and went with single brands that could go into the retail market there. A lot of infighting amongst the cabinets here. How do they tighten up the ship and kind of focus on what's important here uh, to drive growth uh, this year? Well, I think there's no uh, differences amongst the cabinet members. The problem is the uh, government did finally take the plunge on some of the key reform areas which had been stalled for a couple of years now. FDI is on hold. It's not been reversed. But there was a furore in the parliament, as you know, by some of the leading opposition parties. And the prime minister had to, and the cabinet had to put this on hold. Part of that piece has gone through, 100 percent FDI and single brand retail has gone through. The 51 percent FDI in multi-brand retail is on a pause and going through a consultation mode. We are very hopeful that in the next few months we should see that going through as well. Then there is the companies bill, the banking reform, the pension reforms, all are on the anvil. But India has a very uh, difficult uh, political situation by way of a coalition government. Prime Minister is committed, the uh, cabinet is committed, but I think they need the political resolution to many of these things. Okay, final, co uh, sorry. Yeah, I, final comment I, here I, for this I, uh, first I segment. Find, I find these conversations, and particularly observations by Western observers, somewhat, somewhat silly. Uh, if you look at the momentous economic change that China and India, for example, and Brazil in particular as well, have gone through in the last few years, I think we're being a little bit picky to pick out a few months or a year there will, be sec there will be cyclical corrections. Brazil, we were talking before, has Brazil overheated? Is the real too strong? Well, but the general trend is this way. And if we had a similar trend in certain countries in Western Europe or the bulk of Western Europe, we'd be in a far better position. And the, the boot is on the other foot. We have, to get a, we have to get our minds around the fact that economic, political, and social power is shifting to the east, southeast, and south. And it's a very painful adjustment process for us, as we've been experiencing here in Davos in the last few days, and it's very difficult to get our minds around it. And I think we should be a little bit less critical about what's happening in those countries and a little bit more critical about what's going on in our own. Okay, final point I wanted to make here in the, in the first segment is, would you say the number one priority for Turkey and for Brazil right now is to build out the infrastructure so you don't have bottlenecks to growth? Because this is the next wave of the big challenge. Do you want to start? For sure. I think our big challenge to raise our overall savings and investment as a, as a, as a ratio to GDP. I mean, Brazil invests below what we need to sustain growth. So we should raise from 20 to 25, 24, 25 percent in coming years. And the, the priority is to accelerate investment in infrastructure. I mean, those projections that 3.5 percent implicit it is an investment growing by four or five and we need to grow and I'm sure that we will we'll reach a growth of investment around eight percent which makes it a GDP growing for four and a half in even to five so priority of pres our president is accelerate investment as a big support for healthy growth for Brazil Deputy Prime Minister I know this is a big priority for Turkey are you bringing in the capital? Are you bringing in the FDI to, to build out the infrastructure you want? Uh, well, for us, uh, what is happening is uh, Turkey is growing fast, but also our income distribution is becoming uh, more and more fair. So the gap between the rich and the poor is narrowing in Turkey, and that's quite an exceptional case. I think Brazil is another exception, but all across the world, in developing world or developed world, income distribution is getting worse. But a better income distribution is also meaning in Turkey a rising middle class, young and growing population, 
uh, having better and better income levels and ready to spend more. But then this good domestic market also means low saving rates for us. Mm. And nowadays our focus is more, uh, probably somewhat like Brazil, to increase the saving rates so that we are able to also invest more. <coughs> invest more as the public sector for infrastructure, uh, but also as the private sector to build more capacity. But invest more in uh, higher value added uh, facilities. Invest in more high tech production, not just traditional industries, but higher technology industries, which is going to create more value added overall. Good. I'm going to use the analogy. When you look through the windscreen, you want to be able to see all the potholes that are out there for you. Uh, so we learned since 2009 uh, that you can always get surprised by a big event that throws off the big projections that I put into my opening comments. So to set the framework of our second segment here, uh, let's roll the report on the global risks for 2012, and we'll pick up the conversation from there. In 2011, the BRIC nations proved themselves, if not decoupled, then certainly resilient to the economic storm that engulfed the West. But in 2012, and already saddled with a stalled Eurozone, new dangers loom large on the horizon. A soft landing in China, manufacturing slowdown in India, a credit boom in Brazil, political risk in Russia, these we know, but there are others. Rising tension over Iran's nuclear ambitions puts world energy supplies at risk. The impact of higher oil prices would ripple through every nation. Yeah, but, yeah. How elections in Russia and America and the leadership changes in China will affect the global economy cannot be predicted right now. But with global growth set to barely rise above 2% this year, we can say the risk of currency manipulation, unhelpful economic policies, and protectionism will increase. Last year, the Arab Spring was unexpected and quickly engulfed the region, toppling leaders and breaking economies as it went. Any country that ignores the seeds of discontent this year, political alienation, unemployment, rising fuel and food prices, does so at its own peril. But perhaps the greatest risk to emerging markets remains the Eurozone. A failure to resolve the sovereign debt crisis in Europe could derail the global economy, bringing down with it the BRIC nations as well. Those in emerging markets will pay special attention to Italy and Spain over the coming months. In 2011, the BRICs proved themselves to be resilient. But this year, perhaps we will see just how reliant upon Europe and North America they remain. Sunil uh, Mittal, we've talked about the Eurozone. We don't want to dwell on it here in this emerging market conversation. But is that the greatest risk to global growth in your view as you see it today? Not really. I mean, I'm going to build a very uh, different picture here. Uh, if you look at the emerging markets, and let's start with India, 1.2 billion people, 55% below the age of 25, it's a continent of consumers. We are not witnessing any abatement of demand on the consumer side, be that services, be that food, be that products. People are still consuming a lot. There is, of course, a, a concern that the government uh, social programs are probably taking a lot of money out of the system, as what Stephen said, and fiscal deficit is growing, and that balance needs to be done. But in a worst-case scenario for us, we are just below 7% uh, growth for the current year. And for a trillion-dollar economy, that's a very, very good achievement. In a bad year, India, on the last count, had $31 billion of FDI. And this number may get adjusted upwards by the time the final count comes through. And that's still very solid. So investments are coming through. Infrastructure buildup is happening, perhaps not at the pace at which we would want to get back to 9 or 10%, but we are okay. So in India, you should say, you know, hope for the best, prepare, prepare for just below the best. Mm. It's not going to be the worst. Now, you go to Africa, a billion people, especially the sub-Saharan Africa, consistently now clocking out 7% growth, of course, on a base which is lower, but it's showing uh, tremendous uh, improvement in its uh, indices in growth and consumption pattern, again, are very strong. My view is the emerging market economies are going to propel the global economy of the, from the current problems that they have. The Western factories, the technology, are all going to find buyers and consumers in the emerging world. So I, I remain hopeful that we will play a very solid role 
in giving support to the otherwise fledgling uh, world economy. Deputy Prime Minister, uh, the policy of Turkey has been to engage with Iran. We heard from the U.S. Treasury Secretary during his uh, presentation today. He mentioned higher oil prices with the risk because of escalating tensions in the Straits of Hormuz. Do you think it's wise to move down a path of greater engagement or to apply uh, more intense unilateral sanctions to get them to the bargaining table? Now, from the very beginning, we had big doubts about the effectiveness of the sanctions, whether it's a UN Security Council resolution or a unilateral sanction. Uh, and so far, we didn't really see any concrete results of, of sanctions. Whatever it was intended for, it is not really working out. That's why from the very beginning we thought engagement was going to be very, very important. And being neighbors with Iran and understanding each other well and approaching Iran as a country which we should all, I think, show also a level of respect and make sure that they are, their dignity is conserved. And when we talk with a country and if we really want to cooperate and have a negotiated outcome through diplomatic ways, I think it's very important how we pick the style of approaching that, that country. And we still believe that if, there's a, if there's going to be a solution, it will have to be a, a diplomatic solution. And no other means is going to get any uh, favorable results. We are against nuclear weapons in our region, definitely. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, using nuclear energy for peaceful purposes is the right of every sovereign nation. So we have to also keep the right balance. Of course, it's important for Iran to be transparent, to be cooperating with the international community, with IAEA and so forth. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, I think better mutual understanding is also something uh, which is, uh, which is uh, necessary. Simple pressure and expecting Iran to do something just because of pressure is probably not going to work. It has not worked so far, and we still have doubts if it's going to work or not. Stephen, it would be good to get your thoughts on could this be the biggest global risk if tensions do escalate and prices uh, don't have a foundation of $100 a barrel, but they go to 125, 130, 140, what would you say is the biggest risk for 2012? Well, you know, these predicting shocks, John, is ex extremely difficult. Um, I mean, last year at the, at the World Economic Forum, where we're sitting here predicting shocks, and, and no one spoke about the Arab Spring. So it's really presumptuous of us to try to uh, you know, pick out the, the next black swan. In, in the film clip, you know, there was a long list of, of, of potential uh, risks, and I think um, it, it was a fairly inclusive risk. But you know, my guess is there's something out here that is not uh, on, on that list. One that uh, was sort of alluded to here was the uh, the, the political uh, leadership issue, uh, U.S., Russia, uh, transition in China. Uh, one, a, a risk that worries me a lot, though, is, again, to get back to this uh, global dimension of the problem, and that is weak growth in the developed world, still high unemployment, uh, does evoke a, the potential of a protectionist uh, assault uh, developed uh, versus developing, and right at the top of that agenda is U.S.-China trade frictions, uh, featured uh, prominently, by the way, uh, in the campaign platforms of um, Mitt Romney, uh, as well as something that has been mentioned several times today here in Davos uh, by uh, Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner uh, and uh, uh, his deputy, uh, Lael Brainerd. So we can't take these uh, U.S.-China risks uh, lightly, and I think we need to think about them. Good. Before I go to Martin Sorrell, Lee Dacoy, your view on the biggest uh, global risk here. There's a big transition coming up at the leadership for China, uh, a well-managed transition that we don't have to worry about. So anything else you want to identify that we should sure. be watching out for? Well, I think different countries have different uh, risks uh, because the emerging market economies are actually not a monolithic group. Right? For a country like China, I think the top risk still comes from the from Middle East, from Iran. The crude oil price going up perhaps is not the worst scenario. The worst scenario I worry is that when the oil price goes up, the free market mechanism of the crude oil market may break down. 
right? If the market price goes up to more than $150 a barrel, who knows? There will be rationing in the, up from the upstream. Countries like India, countries like China, without much access to the upstream oil, may well be the victim of, uh, of this uh, collapse of the free market. That, to me, is the top risk uh, for China. Another risk for, for a country like China is uh, trade protectionist uh, movements, not only from the U.S. I now worry more from some of our friends, friendly countries, right? I wouldn't name, right? Who are actually very worried about China. Look at the Chinese economy. The Chinese economy's trade surplus is coming down from what used to be 7.5% of GDP to last year's just 2% of GDP. And this year, most likely to come down to 1% of GDP. And in another year, zero trade balance. However, from a bilateral point of view, many countries don't perceive this way. They only look at bilateral trade surplus, the even industrial trade, sur trade structure. They are, they are subject to industrial lobbies, right? Putting on various trade protection measures that would provoke certain kind of reactions from within China. China is also a politically quite fractured status today, right? So that's to me the biggest, mark, biggest risk. Now, the political succession actually may imply great opportunities because new leaders coming in, playing new energy, and these new group of leaders are actually quite unique. These guys went through the hardship during the Cultural Revolution, growing up in the countryside, and these people went to college when they were already early 20s, in 1977, 78, right? So they were educated in the era, or in the, in the years of the honeymoon years of reform and opening up. So I see great opportunity with the mm. political succession in China. This is not a risk, it's opportunity. Good. And Martin Stroll, you're spread they, out. And they don't have to run for office every two, every two years. Which makes it a lot easier. We, we yeah, know where it, China is going. I wanted I, to I give just, you a quick brief introduction okay, so just, before I ask you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you have to spread your risk yeah. because of the strategy you've yeah. used. So how do you try to manage the risk okay. uh, going forward well, now that you've gone into the emerging markets in such a large way? Don't call them emerging markets. They're faster growth markets. Right. Um, if you just frame the risk, look at last year. We, we grew, we budgeted 5% top line like for like growth, excluding acquisitions uh, and currency. Uh, market expects us, I can't comment, but 5 to 6%. Uh, this year, we're, we're budgeting 4%. So we've already taken into account a little bit the increased level of risk. If I know, if we talk about the known black swans, Stephen, uh, let's call them grey swans for a minute, <laughs> there, there is an inequality risk that nobody's mentioned. There's an inequality risk that we see in the Occupy, Davos, Wall Street movement. We also see a, an inequality risk in India, in, in China, in Brazil. There are these issues in Russia. These issues are being raised. That's one. Second risk would be Iran. I think in doing our budgets, we put Iran to one side. If that happens, we'd have to reassess the position. A European explosion, we put to one side. If we can't reach agreement or the banks... Uh, you're, not, you're not expecting an explosion. We're not expecting it. We think they'll muddle through. I'll come back to that, that in a second. Arab Spring is baked in last year. If the Arab Spring has become an Arab winter, which to some extent I think it has, as we, as we look at these Middle Eastern states and whether they will move in, in the, the secular Muslim model of Turkey or the more extreme fundamentalist model of Iran, that obviously is going to have an implication. But we saw dislocation to our Middle Eastern business last year, and that, again, is baked in for this year. Russia is baked in as well. I'm, I'm a great believer that, that Europe has moved to the east as well, and the growth, the growth part of Europe is the axis, forgive the word, but the axis of Germany, of Poland, and Russia. Events in Russia, political events in Russia, have brought that under a bit of pressure. But if President Putin looks as though he maybe will set at least for six years and maybe for 12 years. We'll have to see how that comes out. The China trade risk, I think, is a serious one. Stephen mentioned two events. There's another event that happened this week of importance. The State of the Union message mentioned specific action that America is going to take in relation to China. So we're going to have more chicken and tire incidents, it looks like. You don't uh, think that's coming. just political for 2012? I think the speech was a political speech. I think it won, won votes. I think it made more likely that President Obama would be re-elected. The practicality is <laughs> how do you tax a company that offshores jobs you know, in America? It's a very difficult thing, very difficult thing to do. 
The real risk, I think, and Stephen is absolutely right, there may be things that we, well, there, there definitely are things we haven't discussed here at Davos, as we know every year, that happen that we don't forecast. The real risk I'm, that I'm worried about is not 2012, it's 2013. It's the post-American deficit that has to be dealt with by the re-elected Obama or Romney, if it's Romney, or Gingrich, if it's Gingrich. If, oh, if, with, if, with the risk of yeah. the President Obama being re-elected and losing the majority in both houses. Exactly. Which exactly. would exactly. inhibit, the, this is a risk. That, I mean, we a, have exactly. a year of many changes. With that. There's elections in France, quite uncertain. We have elections in Russia. We have change in China. But, and we also have in the US. I mean, we have of the f five members of the UN Security Council, four will change this year, which makes the global governance in terms of security uh, changing. And uh, about Iran, I would wish to say that uh, there is a bit of rhetoric in the Ormuz threat. But if I agree with uh, the comment made by the Prime Minister that, you know, if you press too much, and it's important to have a channel of dialogue. So you press, you have excessive pressure, it may backfire. I mean, I think you should True, true. Take, China, too. Yeah, yeah. U.S. China. Yeah, the same. I, I think the, the obsession now to contain China, uh, U.S. changing U.S. policy, we should uh, be uh, careful in watching these. Great. Good. This is excellent. Nicely done. Gentlemen, I would like to uh, open the floor to questions, if I may. And we have a couple of special guests that I'd like to call on before we get to the other questions. We have uh, His Excellency the Finance Minister of Pakistan, Hafez uh, Sheikh, here in the front row. We can get a microphone to him, uh, sitting with Ikram Sagal, if we have the microphones out. Uh, would you like to comment first about, uh, I'm sure you don't have a question for the panel, but I'd love to hear a comment about how Pakistan, we're thinking primarily in the political sense uh, and the geopolitical sense, but you were talking about uh, structural reforms to the budget deficit, long-term debt, trying to restart privatizations. Where are you today? Okay, uh, thank you, John. Let me start by first saying it's been a, you know, interesting and illuminating discussion. But uh, part of the problem with discussions like this is that we have categories like emerging markets. And then the discussion focuses on four or five of them. When in fact, there may be, I don't know, 50, 100, 150. Uh, so exactly, uh, you know, what are we talking about? Uh, similarly, I think uh, when we say emerging markets are going to carry the load, are we talking of four countries or 50 countries? Because my sense is that we should get our categories right if we want to be, you know, getting to some kind of a handle on the operational part of the discussion. Second is, uh, from the beginning, we know that the world is interdependent. Nobody, no single country, even China, can pull the weight for everyone else. And the other point is, in a globally interdependent uh, world, what happens to Europe or so-called West is going to, sooner or later, catch up with the growth rates of the so-called so emerging countries. So I believe that, you know, the big lessons we have learned in dealing with crises or in dealing with economics in general is that we need each other and nobody can go it alone. Uh, the second uh, point is that domestic economic management is important because if there are 50 emerging countries, maybe 10 of them have very different growth rates from the other 40. And that is because the way they are managing their fiscal uh, deficits, the way they are controlling their uh, desire to spend, the way they are managing their exchange rate policy, and so on. Uh, the, the third point I want to make is that irrespective of what happens to growth rates, there are new stresses in the global system. And I think apart from growth, what's important and is, was discussed is what happens to uh, people? Because the new uh, stresses that are emerging, such as uh, climate change, 
For example, we had floods in Pakistan last year, which cost us $10 billion. And many countries of the world are experiencing this. Uh, floods and droughts and dramatic rainfalls and other calamities. Second, if as it was pointed out that good economics is going to lead to austerity, there will be less to spend on international public goods like vaccination, like money for IDA in the World Bank. Similarly, if there is going to be a, a political consideration to shift towards protectionism of domestic industry, it means there will be less for trade. And the interesting or a rise in commodity prices will create food insecurity. The reason I mention these things is food insecurity, uh, climate change, protectionism, and austerity and less money available for international commitments all are going to create new stresses for the poor. Hmm. And the greatest number of poor are in the two countries that are doing so well on growth. And so on the one hand, we could be talking about 6%, 8% growth. On the other hand, we could have hundreds of millions of people getting seriously impacted by these, you know, black swans or gray swans or whatever. Great. So I think a balance has to be struck in terms of both uh, the, the role of domestic economic management and international coordination to move towards... Very good. If Sunil, I was going to ask you and Lita Koyde to comment on that because you're the two you know, pillars that we're referring to here. And then we'll take a question from back there. Do we I can just have the to, microphone back there as well. I just wanted to comment on uh, what the minister from Pakistan said. I think the difference is, <clears throat> excuse me, between interdependence and overdependence. And I, I'm, unfortunately, I think that's the difference between India and Pakistan today. We wish that you would take an equal load in the emerging markets. But the fact is you are currently uh, fighting with the domestic situation and your dependence on the world is far too high as compared to India. So when we talk about the emerging markets which will take the load, obviously it is those countries which are able to do so. Well, two quick comments on your, on your very important points. Number one is that there's another aspect which we have not touched upon in our discussion, that is the emerging market economies are actually helping stabilizing today's financial markets because a huge chunk of capital flow in the form of currency reserves are actually from the emerging market economies. So one way or the other, this money is working day and night. Currently, they're stabilizing the U.S. economy, mostly, not flowing in, into the European, it's European countries, right? So this is something I want, really want to emphasize. So if we want to come up with a solution for the European situation, right, the emerging market economies are actually part of the solution. That's, do not forget about this point, right? Second point is that I fully agree that the human aspect of the poor countries should not be forgotten. In fact, if you come to a simple calculation, 5% of total amount of money going into the U.S. financial markets or European financial markets, stabilizing the uh, sovereign bond market, sovereign bond markets can easily be diverted into some poor countries and can make great pro progress in relieving many of the human sufferings. So indeed, I fully, I'm fully with you. So we should not forget about the human suffering of people in the poor countries, and we should devote actually a small proportion of our money into these countries, and the big progress can be made. Good. Martin, very quick Just comment very and quick questions quick. from the floor. Gro growth give, deals with the poverty issue and economic improvement. You asked for a definition. Let me give you a definition of the, of the BRICS or the faster growth markets very quickly. BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, MIST, Mexico, South, South Korea, Turkey, Indonesia, and I'd add the following, which are in the next 11, Philippines, Vietnam, Nigeria, Pakistan, Egypt, Bangladesh, point out that Iran is actually included in Jim O'Neill's definition of the next 11, and I'd add Colombia, South Africa, Argentina, Thailand, Angola, and Kenya. Those are the, those are the countries that we regard as being the fast growth markets that we're focused on as a result. <laughs> Question from the floor. Roland Rudd, RLM Finsbury. We've seen the issues of inequality and the backdrop of the French and US presidential election. How concerned are the panel that, that these type of issues that fight out in the 
fast-growing markets could lead to governments doing things that could be anti-business. And I want to just quickly ask Mr. Mr. Barbizan, are you really as interested in joining the European Union now as you were when you first started the talks? <laughs> do, do you need to? Uh, I'm going to say, Martin doesn't like me saying, let's point east, but you point to the east in a very, very successful way the last 10 years. <laughs> well, uh, we are still in the European Union accession process. We are still a candidate country, and we still have a very clear target in front of us to become a member. Why? Because we believe that European Union is an entity of values. And we think that by having the criteria, benchmark, and the standards of the EU for our own political reforms, it is quite interesting for us. So that we can always move for better in the political reform area. On the economic side, though, I agree that uh, European Union or the Eurozone doesn't really set a good example for us anymore. And I think we are already overperforming in many areas. But regardless, I think the world needs a strong Europe. The failure of Europe means the failure of the values and ideals that the European Union stands for. And I think the problems with, the, with Europe, European Union or Eurozone more specifically is because there is no longer good respect for the values themselves. The countries themselves didn't follow the rules, standards, like the Maastricht criteria. And very simple, if Eurozone countries implemented the Maastricht criteria, we wouldn't have such a problem right now. We wouldn't have been talking about the Eurozone crisis nowadays. So the criteria, the benchmark, are actually, ideally, and theoretically, they are good. But problems are because of not implementing them. So we still believe in those criteria, but we don't believe in what the Europeans are nowadays doing. Stephen, quickly. Then I might go to the floor after that. Yeah, I just <clears throat> need to inject a, a note of caution here. The, the, the danger of Davos is extrapolation. <laughs> we always tend to uh, be consumed by what's happening right now, whether it's a euro crisis or resilience in uh, the emerging markets, and presume that that is the future. And yet what we know about reality checks is the extrapolator always falls on his or her sword. This is a challenging period for the world, for the developed world, for the Eurozone, for you and Turkey, and for all the other countries uh, involved here, including my favorite economy in the world, China. This is a challenging period, and we cannot pretend that we are not going to meet these challenges head on. Good. Do not extrapolate. We uh, often talk about fast-growing economies, and we were, in my reference, uh, as the host of Marketplace Middle East, we've been talking about Qatar. But how about Mongolia? So I, I saw the vice minister a little <laughs> bit earlier. I think it's 27% was the growth for uh, 2011. So this is a kind of a whole new dimension for, for growth. Any comments of what you've heard so far? Well, 27.8%. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, in, in nominal terms. So we are still struggling with inflation. That's more than three times the rate of China, and that's Stephen's favorite economy. No, but that's nominal. What is it in real terms? 17.3. So uh, we have uh, have challenges. uh, But I think uh, uh, having a strong China is also, uh, uh, I think, favorite of uh, all of us. uh, But uh, having no neighbors except Russia and China, I think uh, we love seeing China grow. And uh, we, we are trying to build the economy the, the, uh, on the back of the strong demand from China for our commodities. But at the same time, the challenge is to balance uh, and not uh, lose sight of the need to uh, grow our people, grow our infrastructure, and uh, um, you know, focus on uh, uh, avoiding Dutch, re- Dutch curse and natural resources, curse, Dutch disease, sorry. And uh, I think when all said and done and when the dust settles, what I want to refer to when I'm uh, uh, granddaddy, uh, to the phenomenon that we see, you know, uh, in Mongolia, uh, uh, is a wolf running in between the Russian bear and Chinese dragon in the 21st century. <laughs> 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 Very good. Please. Question from the floor. Uh, 
Uh, John Chipman, uh, Chief Executive of the International Institute for Strategic Studies based in London. I completely agree with Sir Martin Sorrell that the great geoeconomic traffic is South, uh, South. Europeans and Asians look at Asia, they look at uh, Europeans and Americans look at Asia, they look at South America, they look at Middle East. But the important thing is that Middle East, Africa, Asia, Latin America is looking at each other and the traffic is there. But with that heightened traffic can sometimes come traffic accidents and that's why I have a question for uh, Mr. Coutinho and David Lee. There is now a good deal of tension between Brazil and China. When I was in Brazil earlier this month, I got a big lecture from the Sao Paulo business community as to how uh, China is artificially inflating the value of the real by buying lots of real in order to gain uh, market share. I hear politicians in Brasilia are concerned about China buying lots of land uh, in Brazil for food security purposes and legislation needs to be passed uh, to prevent this. How, uh, Mr. Coutinho, can you contain the risk of Brazilian uh, Chinese uh, trade or currency wars and how, David Lee, can you give confidence to Brazil uh, that China uh, can trade and act in Brazil uh, in a beneficial manner that shouldn't frighten people? Okay. Luciano, do you want to tackle it first? Thanks for the question. Well, I th uh, China uh, uh, relationship with Brazil on balance is extremely positive because it, it is a, a tremendous market for the expansion of Brazilian exports. It's on one hand that, and on the other hand, we also have a very uh, a friendly relation at the top of the political and strategic, geopolitical and strategic relationship. Uh, between the two governments. So we, if we have trade frictions, this is absolutely uh, uh, a common thing to be uh, in a rational way to be administered in uh, reasonably. So I don't see this as a, as a, 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 uh, a dividing or a, a clash between Brazil and China. Martin, just a second. I want to go yeah. to Lee Dacoy first. Yeah. Lee? Uh, well, there's, a tremendous, there's a tremendous misunderstanding between the two countries and peoples in the two countries. From the Braz Brazilian side, I fully understand. You are very much worried about China. Such a huge country, lots of people earning low wage rates, and a huge amount of investment going into your country. You don't know what may happen next. I fully understand. From the Chinese side, Many investors, many entrepreneurs do not fully understand your culture, frankly speaking. So I think, I really think it's very unfortunate. Indeed, the two countries can work together. The two countries' endowments are fully complementary to each other, right? One country having huge amount of resources, the other country having right, a demand for your resources. The other country, one country can produce something, the other country can also improve your manufacturing sector, right? So, the issue is more, more exchange of views, more traffic of human flow, right? Rather than capital flow, human flow. More direct flights between the two countries, more understanding, more understanding between the two peoples. So I am optimistic. With more understanding, more education of our investors, I really think the two, country, the two great countries can work together for the benefits of the peoples. Okay. One, one, Martin, sp one specific case. Uh, which gives us hope. Uh, Jap uh, Chinese car manufacturer, truck manufacturer Jack, JAC, launched their brand in Brazil, I think it was in March of last year. The Brazilian government increased the tariff and import price quotas on imports uh, and uh, against foreign manufacturers. What did the Chinese do? They opened a plant, I think in Bahia, within about three months and started producing Jack cars and trucks inside the tariff wall in Brazil. So the response was the entrepreneurial but Chinese, and in this case, it was a Brazilian importer who we know well, a response to. But that's absolutely uh, legitimate <coughs> absolutely. to defend jobs, absolutely. I mean, and attract foreign investment. Uh, that's the positive agenda. Then. I believe that we have a positive agenda to be built, and I'm we one uh, 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 personally engaged in these, so I, I, I uh, go to China quite often. We have this cooperation. So we understand that we should uh, arrange in a positive way and we, 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 have, we have to do our own homework. We have to make our manufacturing more efficient, more innovative. So we can't complain if we're not doing our, our homework. But we should do it and we should, of course, 
protect our jobs, but not just resorting by pure protectionism, but, but with positive policies. Good. Final comment to Stephen Roach, and then we wrap it up. You just put your finger on a, a key potential flashpoint. We want to protect our jobs. You're not alone. Every country, especially in the developed world where growth is not fast enough to lead to reductions in high levels of employment, they want to protect their jobs. And that is the arena of tension that I think will continue to play out, not just in this political year, but in the years beyond. And, and you may not like the label of developing economies, but I think uh, the battle for jobs will be fought between developed and developing economies for years to come, and we've got to figure out how to do that much better than we're doing now. Good. I want to thank the Deputy Prime Minister, the two ministers that contributed to our debate, and the questions from the floor. Just a round of applause for our panelists, and thanks a lot for joining us for the uh, CNN debate. <laughs>